Hello and welcome to Gif Gaff Gaming. We're here in Sheffield at the National Video Game Museum where we're going to learn about the fascinating history of British video games, talk to the people that made them and maybe even play one or two of them. Like this one. Or this one. Or this one. In the early 1980s, home computers were slowly making their way to British households. They were expensive at first and seemed pretty complicated. I mean, would you know how to program this? And yet, many people learned how to program impressive software. The British-made ZX Spectrum was the most popular computer thanks to its low price and sleek design. And thanks to the passion of many young programmers, you could even play games on a ZX Spectrum. Games like Manic Miner. Manic Miner was a groundbreaking game in its day. What made it impressive was that it was created by then 17-year-old Matthew Smith in his bedroom in just four weeks. And he wasn't the only one. The UK was full of young people testing their skill in game design. Meet the Oliver Twins. There was a moment in the 1980s when 7% of all UK game sales were attributable to them. We've sat down with Philip and Andrew Oliver to have a chat about gaming in Britain in the 1980s. <laughs> we started playing games in the arcades. We just had pinball machines and fruit machines and then suddenly, hey, there's like a game that's a TV um, and it would have been probably Space, Space Invaders. Invaders. We saved up enough money to buy a Dragon 32. Had a proper keyboard, 32K of memory, eight colors. What's not to like? One of the ways in which you transmitted games was to actually have them published in a magazine so that other people could type them in. Crazy slow, usually never worked, um, but it did kind of teach programming. This was a time where actually most of the games were being written by sort of just older teenagers. So the fact that we were at school writing these things, we were aware that even Matthew Smith, who's, who's written this, it looks as though he's literally just left school and writing these things. Our dad made the throwaway comment, if you can make more money than me in your first year, you won't have to go to university. We kind of racked our brains as to what we could do, and we came up with the idea of Robin Hood. Nobody owns it. It's a pretty obvious thing, you're, a, you're the hero character, you've got projectile weapons, and you've got an obvious goal, rescue maid Mariam. Uh, it all seemed to add up to us. The game became a number one bestseller for that Christmas. Uh, did spectacularly well. They had it converted to the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum. We, at that point, thought, well, this, this could go ballistic. We just need to just keep doing that again and again and again. And for the next five years, we did. We set ourselves a month timeline on every single game. It was funny, because newspapers would say, hey, these guys are like lead a rock star lifestyle. <laughs> like, we were sitting, in front, really of a, we were sitting in front of a computer all the time, yeah. apart from the occasional interview. I was drawing the graphics, and I was very frustrated that the head of the guy, I had three pixels by three pixels and three colours I was allowed to use. If I put a nose on a single pixel, it looks like Pinocchio, and if I don't, it looks like he's been punched and he's got no nose. As an offhand thing, I just drew a really large face um, in the sprite space that I had, big eyes, and I was kind of showing Andy going, hey, look, I can make him blank, I can do this. And for just a couple of hours, I just started messing around with this big head. We decided, rather than doing a regular jump, we'd actually spin him every time he jumped. But then our dad made the funny comment. He goes, your character, he's going to be dizzy if he just keeps spinning like that all the time. So how many dizzies were there in total? 12 or 13, originally. But then we were a few more on the Nintendo, the Mega Drive. They just hit the right note at the right time with the right technology and the look is very, is very iconic, um, because of the limitations more than anything. As the decade was coming to an end, Peter Molyneux's studio Bullfrog released Populous. The game gave you godlike powers to fight for control of the world's population against other powerful deities. Way to tickle our ego, huh? As hardware and software developed, so too did the games. And by the mid-1990s, it was almost unfathomable how far we'd come. 
gaming was a bit less DIY. Most studios worked from an office rather than someone's bedroom. And with gaming going mainstream, small UK studios were working hard to compete with global powerhouses. It changed a lot in the 90s. You've gone from an industry that was very much a cottage industry where game developers were working in their own bedrooms and creating titles you know, in just one or two people teams to actually having you know, some kind of company, a, a place that you went to work, a place with its own headed note paper where you could you know, turn up and actually do a day's work as a game developer. On all the 8-bit machines, it was me and Andrew pretty much doing everything. The minute you had to move to 16-bit machines, you had to have teams of five or six people with different disciplines. It started getting very expensive. The hard work of small British studios did not go unnoticed by the big players around the world. When Nintendo was looking to release a new Donkey Kong game, they decided to go with a UK-based studio, Rare. With Donkey Kong Country, Rare created a game considered by many as the best in the franchise, partly thanks to 3D graphics that were incredibly impressive for the time. But Rare wasn't the only small studio getting noticed by a global brand. When the PlayStation 1 came out, Sony needed a launch title to go with it. Something that could really show what the console was capable of. That game was Wipeout. It was a fast-paced racing experience in a futuristic setting. A soundtrack by Chemical Brothers, Prodigy and others helped PlayStation bring gaming to the mainstream. Nice one. Throughout the 90s, particularly Sony, I think did a really good job of marketing the PlayStation and making Gaming just feel like it was part of the sort of diet of things that you do. You listen to music, you go out with your friends, and you come back and you play PlayStation. Yeah, we had to up our game, uh, you know, very, very quickly, overnight pretty much. When I started, it was chip uh, systems. Basically a six voice chip, so you got six notes simultaneously. And then of course in 1994, when the first CD consoles came out, yeah, it was a massive game changer. Now we can put live guitars on there, we can do singing, we can do anything we want. Nice variation, mixing the short and the long. You know, bringing commentators and you know, recording voices as part of Actua Soccer so that you could hear realistic sounding uh, commentary as you played the game. Perfect, you found. Oh! The disc-based system gave you the capacity to be able to do that kind of thing. Anything you could record in a recording studio, could then become the soundtrack for a game. So that could be dance music like the Chemical Brothers, it could be a big orchestral score like in Tomb Raider. When Tomb Raider came out, it, it made a big sort of buzz. I always wanted to put more emotional content into games and I was waiting for the right opportunity to do that. And I felt that Tomb Raider was that. It's the beginning of you know, what could be an interactive movie. And there certainly wasn't time to script music for the entire game. It, it wasn't possible, and it didn't make sense to do it like that. Old movies in the past, when you got the guy on the piano playing for the entire length of the movie, well, of course, as movies got better, they stopped doing that. In 1997, Bullfrog and Peter Molyneux released another hit with Dungeon Keeper. It takes the god game genre they invented and turns it on its head. You're still powerful, sure, but now you play the bad guy. This was a time for chasing dreams, but also for laying the groundwork for gaming. Thanks to the hard work of the pioneers of the British gaming industry, games eventually became a cherished part of our culture. When you suddenly walked into a nightclub and there were PlayStations. For me, that really marked the moment that we went as an industry from being a bunch of geeks into part of popular culture. The code that you've written. <laughs> you it, yeah. So yeah, the 1990s were pretty great for gaming, but things were just getting started. We'll be back with part two of the history of British video games with Gifgaf and the National Video Game Museum. Stay tuned. <laughs>